All right, I think we, we have quite a, a large group now, so I suggest we start. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to have you uh, to, on this panel on private security companies as a security risk management measure. So we are going to discuss about the relations between the humanitarian uh, sector, humanitarian organizations, and private security, especially when, they, when humanitarian organizations contract private security. Uh, probably on your way to work uh, uh, today, uh, the past few days, you've met private security guards. If you're working in humanitarian organizations, it's a familiar site. You meet them at the gates. So we are not going to talk today about the, the risks posed by private military actors, by mercenaries, by Wagner. But we're talking about um, the relation that the humanitarian sector now has with its uh, security providers, with the, the world of the private security industry, which is there to to protect uh, sometimes the assets, the staff, the vehicles uh, of humanitarian organizations. And we're very happy to uh, co-host this event with uh, GISF, the Global Interagency Security Forum, uh, which is also um, uh, co-organizing in this conference um, the pillar on, on the security, the security area of concern of this con conference. And we'll have a series of, of events organized by GISF. So I really invite you to look at the program if you're interested in security, security matters, uh, because next week we'll also have a series of, of events organized by GISF uh, in person um, at the conference uh, in Geneva. So thanks to GISF, we also have a good uh, uh, organization. So thanks to the, um, the technicians who are helping us setting up this, this, this discussion. And uh, I should introduce myself, I'm Vincent Bernard. I'm the senior policy advisor at the International Code of Conduct Association, uh, ICOCA, here in Geneva. And uh, I'm here uh, with uh, two experts of the issues we are going to discuss. Uh, today we have uh, Jael Amara, uh, connecting from Nairobi. Good morning, Jael. Good morning, Vincent. So you should find a, a bio in the in the chat. Jade has extensive experience in uh, research uh, in Africa, uh, in marketing research, uh, and we've been very lucky to to work with her. She's a, a research and gender consultant uh, based in Nairobi. She's the founder of a, a research and marketing company, uh, Consumer Options. And uh, um, uh, two years ago, we started working with with Jael on documenting the working conditions of private security guards uh, in East Africa and now across the continent uh, to explore uh, how working conditions of guards can have an impact on, on their behavior and on possible risks of abuses. So Jael will, will discuss this with us this morning. Uh, and then we have also uh, Gregory Beatty, um, who is, uh, again, you will find his, his bio uh, in the chat. So it's a pleasure to have you, Greg. Welcome. Morning, everyone. Thank you very much. He's the Global Operations and Plans Manager at IDG Security, a private security company which has, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, many, many interactions with the, uh, the United Nations, with uh, humanitarian organizations. And he has a quite a, a unique experience because he's been working uh, not only in private security, but he's been also working in the humanitarian sector for many years in complex missions, uh, in situations of negotiations, in situations involving um, uh, lots of uh, uh, interaction on, on security matters. So he has this unique experience of being uh, on both sides and to share his experience of the interaction between the humanitarian sector and private security. As for me, I have also uh, 25 years of experience in the humanitarian sector, working in the field. And I've been uh, working mostly on positions in the field or at headquarters involving uh, advocacy, education, training in order to prevent abuses, uh, violations of the law in complex environments in situations of conflicts. So I've worked a lot on uh, the behavior, regulating behavior of armed forces, of non-state act actors. And now, of course, uh, I'm working on uh, the same topic, but with private security. And ICOCA, the International Code of Conduct Association, is the organization which is there to somehow translate, implement yeah. the obligations in terms of human rights and humanitarian law um, 
towards the private security uh, industry. So uh, a few years ago, uh, we, we started realizing that, of course, uh, the behavior of private security companies is very often um, shaped by uh, the clients, those who contract private security actors. Uh, and we've started dialogue with uh, clients of private security uh, companies. And among them, we find humanitarian organizations. Uh, we, we don't realize that often when working in the humanitarian sector, but actually, uh, the sector has evolved a lot in recent years and has been contracting more and more private security companies uh, to protect staff, assets, um, vehicles, operations, but also to, to gather uh, intelligence. So the International Code of Conduct Association, which is an association composed of states, private security companies, and civil society organizations, is there to create a dialogue on how to improve uh, compliance by private security actors, how to prevent possible abuses, how to develop a, a responsible uh, security industry together. So it, we are a multi-stakeholder initiative. Uh, we are working together uh, to, to develop this uh, responsible security uh, sector. But the dialogue with the clients is key, is, is so important. And here today, we are here to discuss about specifically uh, humanitarian organizations and um, and the private security industry. So um, what I suggest today is that we have a conversation among ourselves. Um, I invite all of you to to ask your questions in the chat, and we'll try to to address them as we as we go. Uh, don't wait for the end. You can ask us questions as as we speak. And I'll try to give an introduction and then pass the floor to to Greg to get his pers perspective on, on this relation. And then we'll, we'll explore more specifically um, a burning question. It's the, the, actually the condition of these guards, perhaps you saw this morning, the guards at the entrance of your compound, uh, how are they treated and what are the responsibilities of the humanitarian organizations vis-a-vis -vis those guards. So we'll discuss that with, that with Jared. So that's the plan for this morning. And again, please ask us questions and we'll try to, to integrate your points as, as we go. Thank you. So perhaps I start with a, a quick introduction on, on the evolution of both the humanitarian sector and the private security industry in recent years. Both sectors have, have grown so much. Uh, we know that working in the humanitarian sector, we've seen the, the growth compared to 20, 30 years ago, the budgets have grown, uh, the reach of humanitarian organizations has grown, and also the um, exposition to risks. We've seen also that security took more and more space in our discussions, in our planning. And so uh, humanitarian actors, which used to rely before mostly on acceptance strategies, on dialogue, more and more have been contracting private security actors. Uh, they've been outsourcing security. They've considered that it was sometimes more cost effective, more professional, uh, perhaps also that transfers the liability to the private security company. Um, and so we've seen this, this trend more and more that they use private security uh, for various missions. Perhaps, Greg, you could uh, list some of these roles you, you play vis-a-vis uh, -vis the humanitarian sector. Yeah, sure. I, I was going to bring this up actually in my uh, little introductory talk, but I mean, there's various different types of roles we do um, as a company and, and all of those services go towards humanitarian development sectors and UN agencies and, and some diplomatic missions as well. But, uh, I mean, they are, I think, largely services that you would expect and would know, um, having been out in any field environment and worked in any humanitarian or development organization, the, the, the personnel guarding type stuff. So when you go into your compound, um, the guys on the gate, those are the guards which are provided by a private security uh, company. This is either in a high risk environment or even in Geneva, um, in an embassy in London. I mean, the guards that are provided for those services, they come from private security companies. They don't they're not employed directly by the UN or the INGOs or the or the diplomatic missions the, the, as I say, they're from private security companies. What we also do is um, training. So if you've been on a heat course or a heat fat course, which is not run by your organization, it'll be run by a private security company. Um, 
Additionally, uh, we do some crisis management type stuff. We don't want to often, but but sometimes we have to step in um, and provide negotiation and kidnap and ransom cases. Um, so almost without doubt, if your organization or organization you know of have had a terrible event like that happen, it would have been a private security company that stepped in um, on your organization's behalf to do that negotiation. Um, and then additionally, on top of that, we do other sorts of crisis management. We do risk reporting. Um, and then also, the, I suppose, the last thing um, I would say is the close protection element. So um, in very high-risk environments, or if you've got particular VIP visits or something, um, senior diplomats or senior UN figures who might be going into a complex environment, we could then potentially provide um, close protection. It's not a service that we provide extensively, um, most of what we do as with many security companies is is that sort of what they just term as man guarding type activities, um, which is basically guards on physical compounds, protecting assets, personnel and, and uh, property. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so um, I could add to that that we've seen private security uh, involved in, in all kinds of different activities uh, more and more. Uh, we see also that uh, moving beyond the traditional guarding activities, uh, we see private security providing cyber security, uh, providing uh, intelligence using open source information. It's a sector which uh, evolves quickly using more and more technologies. We've seen also new roles in private security. We've seen also uh, states contracting private security, for instance, to guard immigration detention centers. Um, We've seen uh, private security involved in the um, guarding prisons, um, in all kind of different uh, roles, and it, it has been more thing changing, expanding very quickly. So uh, beyond the traditional image of, of the guards at the gate, we have many, many uh, possible implications of private security today in humanitarian operations. And again, they are providing uh, security. They are providing a very useful critical service. We see large companies like G4S, Garda World, Securitas, control risks uh, being uh, contracted. We see also humanitarian organizations contracting smaller uh, local companies. Uh, and this industry has been growing tremendously in the, in the past few years. Uh, we're talking about uh, a general trend. It's not only the humanitarian sector using private security, but we see that in all sectors of society that we use more and more the services of uh, private security. Uh, and so we realized uh, a few years ago that actually, despite the fact that there was a clear trend in the humanitarian sector, the relation between the two were not really well documented. So together with GISF, we um, conducted the research and interviewed about 100 uh, specialists, mainly uh, security managers within humanitarian organizations, within INGOs. And 80% uh, of the organizations we, we surveyed said they were using uh, private security at some point. So it's becoming really a mainstream uh, service uh, used by, by uh, uh, the humanitarian sector. And what we found also out of the survey, and perhaps Gregory, you, you can confirm that, is that most of the time, and contrary to the perception we may have in the sector, in the humanitarian sector, it's not about uh, armed guards. Uh, most of the services are, are unarmed. Uh, we're not talking about uh, the use of armed guards uh, in the humanitarian sector, it's not widespread. Uh, that's something you can confirm, right? Yeah, certainly. I mean, we we do use armed guards in, in many instances, but the majority of our guards are unarmed. And when we're working with uh, the likes of INGOs, it would be unarmed. But just to be very clear about the fact that when we are armed, it's through stipulations and, and in the... Uh, procurement process it's it's dictated by um, our clients that we have to be armed so um, the only clients we have where we are armed is the UN and it's strictly stipulated that we have to bear arms um, to, to provide the services for those contracts so mm -hmm. we don't necessarily choose to it comes with a lot more complexity 
Um, and there's a lot of challenges involved in it, but I mean, it's entirely legitimate that we have them. It's we're, it's legal. It's uh, we follow international laws and regulations and standards um, when we do bear arms, and uh, at all costs we avoid being a party to the conflict. In that sense, as I say we're very much doing it on behalf of the UN when we do that. Um, we are looking at taking on a few more diplomatic missions as well, and in some cases, they in in high risk environments they they stipulate as well that you have to bear arms. But we're not looking at those cases. Uh, con sorry, we're not looking at those contracts. We're looking at the ones that are unarmed. So most of our services are unarmed. So yeah, that's something we found in this research. Perhaps I should show it. Uh, it would be also um, the link would be there in the in the chat. You can access the the research. And so the, the research highlighted that, yes, humanitarian organizations are using private security services. Most of the time, these are un, unarmed guards. Um, and if you want, uh, we've also asked uh, humanitarian uh, uh, security managers if they perceived that there were some risks attached to that, uh, to the use of private security. And uh, a majority said yes, that they identified risk which could be related to um, security first. Uh, and that's a bit of, of the paradox when we speak about security is that uh, your own private security uh, provider could become a security risk. And they also perceive potential reputational risk for humanitarian organizations. So we're going to unpack those, those risks. They don't. They did not mention the risks for the community, but we also are aware that actually private security could, um, also in its relations with the local community, create harm. And not many of them identify the problem that we are going to discuss with Jael is the the the, the responsibility that humanitarian organizations have vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the staff of uh, the private security contractors. And again, I have had this experience myself. We were discussing it with Gregory, you know, we're working in humanitarian uh, operations. We are focusing very much on our mission. Uh, we may be friendly with the guards, but we don't consider them as colleagues. And we don't see them sometimes even because they are working for this company and we don't feel responsible and organizations may not feel responsible for them. But what we find is that their working conditions are very often appalling. And one of our key principles in the humanitarian sector is do no harm. And actually, through the contracting of private security companies, which may not pay their staff very well, we could contribute to do harm. So we are going to explore that. So there are many, many risks. And actually, the humanitarian managers, they don't, they don't perceive that. They perceive mostly you know, the risk that could be caused in terms of security, in terms of security incidents uh, by the guards and, and the risk for their, for their own reputation, but not so much all these other dimensions. So when we discuss about those risks, uh, just quickly, and I think it's important we have such an awareness because this is what we want to discuss today is the responsibility of the humanitarian sector uh, when, when contracting private security. Of course, the first type of risks are related to breach of security. Breach of security, which could be caused by the fact that the company is not professional, that it doesn't know how to handle security incidents, and that's actually they don't provide a good service. Breach of security, which could be caused by the guards themselves. Um, I've heard several anecdotes where you had uh, at the local level guards protesting against their working conditions and threatening the humanitarian staff, for instance, to improve their working conditions. And so that could create a security risk for the organizations. So, of course, there are risks uh, linked to, the, to violence um, and risk of abuses of the guards against the local community. The guards have some power. We've seen over time incidents involving sexual violence, thefts, corruption, uh, which could be also related to the lack of professionalism of the guards. Um, something which also we, we are very much aware in the humanitarian sector is that the composition of the private security or company or its link to some parties to the conflict could jeopardize the perception of neutrality of the humanitarian operations. Uh, we often see also, and perhaps we'll discuss that with Jael, that uh, the ethnic composition of the workforce uh, it could be based on, on discrimination. And we could have guards you know, representing only one group of the population. And this will create misperceptions and could reflect on 
the perception of neutrality of human actors. The question of reputation is key. We know that. We know we know it's key for acceptance. Uh, we know that acceptance is is not diffi is difficult to get. Uh, so if guards misbehave, that could damage the reputation of the organization locally, but also internationally. Uh, because when there is a gross violation of human rights, um, we, we've seen with the, the business sector, people rarely mention the name of the company, of the private security company, but we, we remember the name of the, the international organization, which, which is then accused uh, of having you know, uh, committed these crimes or having not... Uh, sufficiently uh, looked at the behavior of their contractors. So this is a major risk for reputation. Um, this creates liability for organizations in terms of contractual liability if they don't um, use due diligence vis-a-vis um, -vis their private security contractors including also in terms of uh, respect for their labor rights, in terms of working conditions. So there are many different types of risks. And these risks are not only, as I said at the beginning, for the, the, the organization itself, but also for the local community and for the guards that we sometimes expose uh, to dangers without ensuring that they have the proper equipment, the proper training, and they may be exposed to violence uh, while uh, trying to protect the human organization. So you see, there are multifaceted risks, and it may be that not it's not only the guards which will be the perpetrators, but they could be also the victims when human organizations are not really paying enough attention to their uh, training conditions of work, etc. So this is just a quick introduction on, on, on this question of risks. We can discuss it further. Uh, Greg, I'd like to turn to you now, and, and perhaps, um, as you've had both experiences, perhaps you can tell us about the perceptions of the United sector on private security and how private security perceives uh, United sector as a client. So thanks, Greg. Yeah, thanks very much, Vincent. I really appreciate it. And it's it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to have this conversation. I think these conversations really are important, and the more we have them, the more dialogue we create. Um, I think ultimately, the more we can sort of fix the industry together. And um, I, I'll sort of, I, I, there's a few things I want to discuss, um, but mostly I'd like to start sort of by shedding light on a topic that I think sparks a lot of debate and misconception, which is the role of private security companies in high risk environments, um, which is largely what you've been talking about, Vincent. Um, but I, I'm not looking to present a counter narrative, rather, I want to sort of present an alternative narrative, I would say, um, as someone who's seen both sides of the industry. Um, I'd like to use this as an opportunity to highlight some of the, the challenges within our industry, um, which I think you, largely the audience as humanitarian development workers are actually empowered to change. Um, and I hope you can potentially walk away from today's conversation and the dialogue we're having over the next hour or so um, with some potentially new perspectives on, on this industry and um, how perhaps you can aid us um, within the industry and myself. Um, how you might be empowered to sort of make some of those positive changes. Um, I just want to go back to the conversation again and just sort of really delineate between what private security, security companies are and what private military contracting is, because I still think just we can brush over it, but I really do think that we have to delineate that fact. And unfortunately, I think many still perceive us through the lens of what is largely an entirely different industry. It's an un a very unethical and murky world of private military contracting. Um, however, I hope to steer today's conversation towards what I say is a far more real and genuine reality of modern private security sector and professional security service providers. Um, and that's one that is heavily legislated, increasingly ethical and principled. Um, I, I don't want to waste a lot of time, but I just want to use a very brief analogy that I was just thinking through as you were talking there, Vincent. And, and it's a bit like if I wanted to jump on a plane from London to Cape Town, um, I was, the, there's three ways I could go about doing that. Either I could um, go online and look at an airline, um, a reputable airline. Um, and I know not all airlines are the same. I know they're not all fantastic and some are better than others. 
but that's probably the best way for me to get to London to Cape Town. And in this analogy, I would say that's ICOCA membership. Um, and then of the extreme opposite end of that, I could go on to, I wouldn't know how to do this. I just want to be very clear about this, but, but I presume I would go onto the dark web. I would find some dodgy uh, military type um, security military contractors um, who could potentially have some dodgy air aircraft, military aircraft who could fly me there. And that seems like a very extreme ridiculous way to go about it but that's effectively the way i see private military companies is is they are very unethical they're very murky you can't find them easily you wouldn't just go on their website to, to find their services and then there's the third option there which is my mate bob who just got his private pilot's license doesn't know how to fly internationally hasn't done it before but he's cheap um and he's going to find me in his little single engine aircraft all the way down to cape town um, and that just seems like a ridiculous way to go about it. And unfortunately, that is the reality that most INGOs would choose when they're choosing their security providers. They'll go for the local uh, company, which isn't legislated, is not an ICOCA member. They don't know how to operate in the sort of environments they're operating in. They're purely there for the profit because my mate Bob with his little aircraft just wants the money. Um, and they're not there to look after their personnel. They're not there to, to work to good ethical standards. And I, it's a bit of a silly analogy. I don't want to make light of it, but I just want to say those are the parallels. Those are the extremes within this industry as well. And I, I hope by the end of the conversation, we'd all go online to, to choose a reputable airline, knowing that those airlines are still, <laughs> they're not all perfect. They're not all doing things as, as you would hope they would. They're still profit driven, um, but they're definitely the professionalized, legislated, internationally recognized companies that you would want to choose if you were going to do something as simple as that. And ultimately, the reason we would choose them is for our own safety. You know, it's it's to keep us safe and our personal are safe. And that's why we choose to, to operate in that sort of way. Um, yet despite this, our industry, industry still has flaws and challenges in many areas. And we're struggling um, for reasons which I think are a lot closer to home. Um, and I think that's why this initial distinction is so important, um, as otherwise I think it has the potential to distract from what the real issues are. We can we can get very much distracted from from the uh, the issues at hand. So before delving into the intricacies of of, of the industry I'm in and private security companies, um, it's crucial to understand our roots a little bit. Um, private security uh, service providers. Um, trace back to a singular purpose, I would say, which is to protect and safeguard lives, assets and property in environments where conventional security measures fall short. Um, that's both here in London or it's in Afghanistan, Baghdad, uh, across Africa. Um, it's exactly the same thing that we're trying to do ultimately. Um, and the mission of most modern private security service providers is grounded in professionalism, integrity and adherence to international standards. Um, and this is a highly legislated industry by numerous international standards, ISOs, PSCs, um, and we maintain pretty transparent working practices, certainly IDG does, um, and a lot of our competitors as well. And we work hard for the memberships uh, with the likes of ICOCA and those we have to go through really in-depth audit processes. I just came out of an audit process with MSS Global, and uh, I've never experienced anything like it. I mean, the, the, the intricacy is into which they're looking at our organization, our practices, and, and they don't come for free. You know, you really have to work hard to, to get those accreditations. Um, whilst I might sound a bit overly optimistic and painting potentially a rose-tinted picture on it, um, for those who are unfamiliar, I think it's essential that we, we draw that distinction between private security companies and what is profoundly different world, as I say, in private military contractors and mercenaries. So private security service providers such as IDG, the company I work for, focus entirely on non-combat services aimed at protection, risk mitigation and asset safeguarding. Um, our services, as I discussed earlier, pretty wide array of services ranging from man guarding um so those guys on the gate explosive detection dogs uh security training like heat and heat fat uh close protection for vips and media and journalists um risk analysis and reporting crisis management hostage negotiation uh cyber and that's just to name a few it's quite a it's quite a broad um service industry that we're in um, and these services are very much tailored to the specific needs of our clients 
um, which in the case of IDG are almost all entirely INGOs, diplomatic missions and UN agencies operating in high risk environments. Um, contrary to misconceptions, uh, the majority of our clientele are humanitarian and development organizations and diplomatic entities, as I say. Um, they entrust us with the vital task of safeguarding their compounds and personnel, um, which enables them to carry out their humanitarian and development missions um, amidst challenging and often dangerous circumstances. However, despite our shared commitment to ensuring humanitarian development workers and diplomatics, uh, diplomatic missions are able to safely conduct their work, we all too often face significant challenges in this industry, and particularly that's in the realms of procurement. So many of our clients, which a lot of you guys in the room, um, are driven by budgetary constraints and seek to force down the prices through rigorous and rigid procurement processes. Um, whilst understandable from a fiscal perspective, this approach often results in ethical dilemmas and compromising the well-being and often local security personnel. And they are often local security personnel. So when we're talking about um, acceptance within the local communities, it's largely the, those local communities that we're recruiting from. Um, in December, I spoke at the Responsible Security Forum uh, run by ICOCA um, on the same subject, actually, and highlighted some recent findings from ICOCA and GISF and their recommendations for improving contracting practices by humanitarian development clients. So just to run through very quickly a few of those, um, one was limited awareness and decision making by the clients and the organisations. Um, and the recommendation was organisations must align contracting practices with humanitarian principles, um, establishing clear policies, risk assessments and service specifications. Second was cost-driven cost selection. Um, so recommendation is security budgets, particularly relating to staffing, should be systematically included in proposals and selection criteria beyond cost should focus on standards and quality. Three was limited awareness of international standards. Recommendation prioritizing compliance with international standards and contracts, including legal provision for duty of care responsibilities, misconduct and termination. Four was major risks entitled by private security contracting. Recommendation was thorough risk assessments and human rights due diligence are crucial to prevent security, reputational and contractual risks. And the final one, which was poor working conditions and importance of relationships, recommendation was prioritizing relationships with contracted personnel, provision of training, involvement in decision making and ensuring fair salaries and improved working conditions. So such pressures to reduce costs can all too easily translate into poor salaries, inadequate benefits and unethical working hours for security guards, the very individuals entrusted with the safety of their clients. Such practices not only undermine the morale and welfare of a guard force, but also jeopardizes the effectiveness and security operations. It is absolutely the responsibility of us as the security service providers and the security companies to ensure such practices are avoided. And we do not wish to overlook that fact. However, in the case of IDG and many ICOCA industry members, the result in, this results in us refusing to take or even bidding on a lot of these contracts, often put out to tender by NGOs, UN and diplomatic missions. As such, I believe it is a joint responsibility and mission for us as security providers, you as our clients, and ultimately your donors who can change this industry for the positive. Um, as responsible stakeholders in the private security sector, it is incumbent upon us to address these ethical dilemmas head on. Collaboration between security providers, clients, and regulatory bodies is paramount to establishing fair and sustainable procurement practices that prioritize both cost effective and human dignity. The professional security sector has changed uh, for the better, I believe, and is continuing to change for the better. Um, 20 years ago, it would have been practically impossible for someone like me to find employment in this industry. Um, but now it's very logical transition for people from the humanitarian and development sectors. Um, and the big companies are certainly trying to attract more people like me into it. Um, and that's for a reason. And uh, furthermore, 20 years ago, there was no ICOCA and there was very little uh, legislation. 
but we've come a long way and continue to make improvements, but we need your help. You as humanitarian development clients need to set the parameters for us in your procurement processes. All too often, the procurement processes immediately write off the most technically, ethically, and professionally uh, qual high quality tender processes and proposals in place of the cheapest, despite the obvious disparities. Um, if such decisions, if such decision making continues, the only winners will be those unethical, unprofessional, and unaccredited companies who do not mind cutting corners and reducing their costs in the worst possible ways in order to increase their own profits. And usually that comes at the expense of their own staff welfare and their client security. Make no mistake as well, this is not about companies such as IDG increasing our profit and you guys footing the bill for it. On the contrary, such moves will likely reduce and restrain profits on the security industry. And as such a point of argument as well, I mean, I actually make less money now than I did when I was working in the humanitarian sector. Rather about, uh, I think this is largely about a shift in mindset and raising awareness for responsible ethical practices, both within the security sector and among our clients in procurement processes. It's about ensuring the men and women tasked to provide protection can do their job safely, with dignity and with the right training and resources in order to keep our clients and the communities in which we operate safe. In conclusion, as we navigate a complex landscapes of humanitarian development and diplomatic security in high risk environments, let's reaffirm our shared values and collective responsibility to safeguard lives and uphold human rights. Thank you very much. I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Back to you, Vincent. Well, thanks, Greg. Um, so I like your analogy with the travel. Yeah, so I got carried away on that one, but uh, <laughs> but I I really do think though that that's that's the reality. You know, it's it it is that different, and it seems it seems like a ridiculous sort of concept to to draw up. And and if we were doing that, if we if you did want to fly to Cape Town or something, there's no way you would consider those other options. They're just they're unrealistic. But unfortunately, in this industry now those highly professionalized, highly um, accredited companies are being pushed aside, which I say it's not about profits on this one. I'm, I'm not trying to steer it in that way. It's, it's about the fact that, you know, these clients are going for the cheapest option, which is often a local solution. And we're all about providing um, support and, and uh, livelihood opportunities for local communities. We do that through our practices. But when you go for a lot of these cheaper solutions, um, you're 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 doing exactly that. It's it's your mate Bob who's flying you to Cape Town, and you just wouldn't do that in reality. I mean, it's it's a ridiculous solution, but unfortunately, that's that's the current landscape that we're in at the moment. And as I say, uh, Wagner Group and Blackwater and all those sorts of companies are are so different from the sort of work that we're doing. We we're very much security service providers. They are very much private military companies and uh, i mean it, it is it's a very murky industry that they work in and i would say it's a totally different industry but yet still there's that misconception i think it's important we draw those comparisons just so we can actually have a proper debate and discussion and dialogue about the, the reality and how we can fix some of the real problems which i think most of the problems that we face are down to the welfare of our own staff and the security for those that we're, we're providing services for um, and if we continue through these quite poor procurement processes to, to force uh, the lowest possible cost, inevitably you end up with the lowest quality um, bidder winning mm -hmm. um, because they can do it on the cheap. And, and you can't do these things on the cheap. It's just not possible. Well, that's uh, what many um, call the race to the bottom in the private security mm -hmm. industry, where because of pressure on, on cutting costs, uh, the less professional, the smaller, and the, the the companies which make benefits out of the exploitation of their staff, let's put it this way, are the ones most often uh, recruited. And the bad news is actually that the humanitarian sector is actually doing the same. Mm. That's what we need to discuss here. And perhaps it's also because of a lack of awareness that we, we found also in, in doing our research we saw that most of the security managers were not aware of the international standards which exist, which are out there. So you mentioned the ECOCA certification, which is a mechanism which is there to ensure that there is 
actually uh, uh, due diligence exhausted by ICOCA on the companies before granting them uh, membership. And this certification um, plays the role of a risk reduction mechanism. So the client is reassured that by uh, contracting an ICOCA certified company, uh, it is giving itself uh, the best uh, chances to have a company which will respect human rights, which will be compliant, which will train its staff and treat its staff decently. So th this race to the bottom has, has many reasons. We can also discuss about the role of donors, perhaps later in the conversation, uh, donors which may not sufficiently pay attention to security, but also the perception that humanitarian actors may have um, when they need to cut costs, and we know that they have limited budgets, that they don't consider private security seriously enough and don't allocate sufficient budget. Now, the consequences are often paid by the staff of the private security companies. And I think it's important we have Jael now um, presenting the research we did in, in, in East Africa in different countries on the, the actual working conditions of these guards you, you meet at... Uh, uh, your compound you meet um, in your work in the field. Uh, so, Jael, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. We've had a lot about um, uh, what's happening in terms of contracting and reputational risk. I'm going to just um, quickly take you through um, some of the results that we had from a market research survey that was conducted in Kenya, um, Uganda, and Tanzania. And this is the voice of the guard. So we have heard a lot about who the humanitarian sector and the NGOs and what they're doing and the risks that they face. However, what is the voice of the guard? What is the private security guard telling us in regard to the services that they're offering? And when we talk about guards here, we are, we're, we're referring to the things that they're doing, which include physical protection, you know that when they come to some of your offices or when they're working within the humanitarian sector, they're the first point of contact. So they're doing crisis management, they're doing security within uh, the premises, they're doing the physical protection, they are um, ushering in guests, and these are the guards that we talk to. One of the things that we need to also understand is that the guarding uh, industry has grown. So um, companies are paying security companies millions. So that says that between 2015 and 2019, UN procurement report shows that they spent over $186 million uh, in, in, in security. This is for DRC, Somalia, Afghanistan, and South Sudan. And this is quite a lot when, when we look at it. And this is just uh, UN reporting. We have many more INGOs uh, who are spending money on this sector. So the question is then what is happening with the guards? And when we undertook this survey, there are quite a couple of things that came through. Our objective really was to see industry practice. And we were just looking at rights, welfare. We were looking at wage, working hours. How long are they working? Do they have access to healthcare? What's their mental and physical health like? And uh, were they facing risks and uh, what kind of risks were they facing in the workplace? And I'm just going to share with you highlights of um, what came through uh, within this study. Uh, we're, we're talking about a sample of about a thousand uh, guards, private security guards in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And we know that this sector is predominantly male. So about 80% of those who were interviewed were male. And we found that a lot of them had worked in the industry for four years and we're young, but they're, they're quite young, they're 25 to 35. So you can imagine you've got a young workforce who are looking for, for, for better things for them, for their lives, and yet they are here guarding. And we also saw that this sector is employing quite a lot of people, and there's lots of families that are dependent on this sector. So the wage that is being given to a guard is covering so many more other people. You, the, the, this family that you're taking care of and yourself. And so there's lots who are um, who are depending on, on, on this industry. And so what did we find in this industry? We found that the industry is very polarized in the sense that uh, we have uh, companies that are very, um, 
they comply with what's needed in, in the sector. And then there were many who were not complying. And depending on the country, we had uh, countries like Kenya where they had lots more security guards, uh, companies, security companies that are registered versus unregistered companies, for example, in a, in a country like Tanzania. We also found that uh, this guarding was high entry, high exit. I came in quickly, I did what I needed to do, and, and I went out. Or something happened in the workplace and I quickly got fired. A lot of blame is put on the guards. So they find that they don't have confidence, they don't have um, work security. They're always on, on the edge, like I may be fired. And that's because they don't have contracts. Many, uh, more than 50% were not giving out contracts because contracts bind the people, the companies that are employing these security guards. So they don't have contracts. We also saw that um, there was uh, management, the higher management, and then there was uh, a level of management called supervisors and then the guards. The supervisors turned out to be very powerful. They would determine how much you earn. They would determine whether you get your income or not. They would determine uh, um, if a, a woman is employed or not. We also saw incidences of sexual harassment coming up and sexual favors being asked for. And so uh, there were all these plays of who is this supervisor and how do I make him happy? When we came to the guards, as I, I said, confidence is low. Why is confidence low? Because first and foremost, the, the, the salaries are quite low. Uh, uh, many of them, 80% and more, were not being uh, paid for working overtime. 80% and more were not taking working breaks. And they worked 12 hours shifts. And many of them, in, in fact, about 70% um, worked seven days a week. That means that they didn't have sufficient rest. And even when you were working 12 hours a day, it, it didn't include your 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 time to get to work and to get to your home. And so a lot of these things then make the guards very mentally unstable. And some of them yeah, said that they didn't feel mentally well, they were stressed out. And when the salaries came, sometimes it came late, sometimes it wasn't enough, sometimes I was just partly paid. But we do have a presence of international companies in all the three East African countries that have elevated uh, the, the the, the sector of being a guard. So you found that more local companies uh, were very um, quick to not follow the law in many ways. And then the, the, the last thing I want to talk about is how guardism is being associated with poor education and is also being associated with a certain tribe or a certain community. And therefore there's less respect being given to the guards. And this of course demoralizes the guards. And um, uh, before I just uh, check out, there are two stories I want to give you that it uh, that has happened. In 2019 in Kenya, we had an International Committee of the Red Cross staff, ICRC staff, uh, how racial insults to a guard. At that time, there was somebody watching and took a video of what was happening. But this person abused the guard, and uh, it became a big matter in, in, in the nation. And this stuff ended up being uh, sent back to being uh, fired and being sent back to their country. Um, in 2024, early this year in Uganda, uh, Uganda is a special because it's one of the countries where the private security guards are armed. We found that uh, there was, a, there was a, a case where a security guard uh, shot at travelers. So he ended up being drunk and um, was upset and shot at travelers. And what we're saying is that some of these things can happen to you in your institution. The question is, are you doing the due diligence that's needed when you're looking at the private security companies? And we had a conversation with some of the private security companies and they said they're in a very competitive market. And in this market, due to the competition, what they're doing is they're accepting lower pay contracts in order for them to continue operations. And um, Greg has just talked about low, um, lower paying contracts. You accept lower paying contracts, but who bears the brand? It's the guard who bears the brand because therefore you compromise on, how much, on their welfare, on their human rights, um, and they end up working more days than they should. They end up not resting and they end up with low pay. And so the effect is a dissatisfied workforce. And we're saying that, what does it mean for you as an humanitarian 
a player or an actor or an NGO? What does it mean for you when you are not doing due diligence on the type of private security companies that you are onboarding? Thank you, Vincent. Back to you. Well, thank you. So, so uh, Jael, thanks for this. Um, we are going to publish these uh, different research in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and you'll find data um, in these papers. Uh, we've already uh, published this research that we conducted uh, last year at the global level, including uh, we've included also some of the data. It's called When the Abuse Become the Abuser. And it, it shows that these uh, terrible working conditions in which we... we we find the guards uh, can lead to the risks of abuses, um, poor performance, but also corruption and, and uh, risks that the, the guards uh, actually commit crimes, especially as they have access to these assets, as they can control access, as they deal with uh, the public. Um, I, I, by the way, I experienced it myself when in, I was working with the, the Red Cross in Nairobi. I remember at the time we were attacked, the compound was attacked by criminals. And um, after the incidents, uh, the police came in and they immediately arrested the private security guards because they assumed they were complicit because they know they are working in bad conditions. And so they were the usual suspects. The, the security guards were immediately arrested by the police. And uh, we see that it can happen also that uh, when guards are not properly trained, they use excessive force and they get arrested as a result. Uh, and it's not the humanitarian organization or even the private security company which face uh, the, the risk, but the guards themselves. The guards are exposed uh, because of the nature of their job. And, and humanitarian organizations are not always uh, really uh, exerting due diligence. So very important to, to look at the responsibility of, um, of organizations. They have a duty of care vis-a-vis -vis their staff, but they have an ethical duty of care vis-a-vis -vis their subcontractors and the security guards they employ. And as Greg said, it's, I think it's, it's, it's really important to have this realization that it's not only about giving more money to the private security industry, but it's about ensuring the quality of services and, and, and ensuring this acceptance and good reputation, as your example of the uh, uh, incident in Kenya shows. Um, so uh, let's, let's discuss a bit about solutions, but do, do we have questions from the, from the audience or contributions or examples you would like to add, anecdotes you would like to share? Please, uh, if you have questions or just raise your hands, just whilst we're waiting for questions, I mean, I think, Joel, it's it's incredible work you've been doing out there. And I think it really highlights some of the key issues and uh, just a, a couple of points off the back of that. I think, I mean, I raised exactly this point when you spoke uh, the Responsible Security Forum in December. But uh, f for me, guarding is not a, uh, it's it's not kind of low level workers, unqualified, inexperienced. It's, it's really considered that way in so many cases. But I don't know if anyone's ever, I haven't done this myself, by the way, but I don't know if anyone's ever sort of stood up in front of a horde of uh, people protesting and try to bring that tension down and try to reduce threats. Uh, but that's what guards are expected to do. And I mean, guards require an awful lot of expertise. They require a lot of training to be sort of working at a high level. I mean, they get weeks and weeks of training every year. Find me a humanitarian who gets weeks and weeks of training every year. I mean, this was my one of my big problems with the sector when I was in it is that they don't they they employ intelligent people and don't give them any training. Uh, we I think in the private security sector we need intelligent people and we train them. You know, we we put people into a situation which have potentially very high risk results. Um, they have to put their own lives at risk sometimes. Um, they're there as a first point of um, deterrence. They're often from the local communities, so that's potentially an increased threat for them as well. They're, they're providers for their own families, but I mean, they need emotional intelligence. They need a good experience in the sector. And when it's when that is treated right and, and they're sort of looked after in that setting, uh, I mean, they get better and better the more qualified they are. We're we're, we're a very small company, relatively speaking. I mean, uh, 
don't normally name names, but our, our one of our primary competitors is G4S. They employ about 750,000 people globally. We employ less than 3,000 people globally. But uh, among that, um, I mean, recently we gave out some awards for length of service. About 500 of our staff have been working for us for more than five years. And uh, on top of that, about 300 of our staff have been working us for, uh, for us more than 10 years. And um, we don't employ that many people less than the age of 30 because you need life experience to be a guard. You need time on the job. You need to have been doing something in advance. And I think that's where it's often treated as a sector where um, it's anticipated it's, it's the lowest form of labor. You don't need expertise. You don't need training. You don't need experience. Um, but it, nothing's further from reality. I think that that's a mindset change that's also required, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a question from Heinrich. Heinrich, would you like to, to ask your question? Yes, I can do that directly. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the many good points that you've been bringing up. And uh, I, I have also the experience uh, about uh, the difficulty that uh, those people at the front are on one side, they have to deliver, but on the other side are also those who um, receive the first um, kickback then if something something goes not the way or not the way the expectations are so um in in uh, part of those points that you already brought up i found that there is friction with uh, very practical issues very often also so and uh, and the private security company ideally is contracted and has uh, clearly described uh, TURs. however often personnel carrying out the, the work is then exposed to direct influence on the side because it's not the same people who do um, issue the contract and then are on the spot receiving the service. So people uh, uh, from the from the organization to be protected take influence on how the, the services are being uh, executed. And then often there is a little bit higher or more expectations than what is described in the TUR. And the other thing is that private security company is also subject to the local law. They have to follow the local law. And uh, and and then tasks have to be carried out within those limits. And that also sometimes leads to um, expectations that are different uh, than how, what, or what they can do um, in execution of their tasks. So my question is, open communication is, uh, of course, without question, um, uh, a way to solution, but what else, or what is your experience in that regard? Mm -hmm. uh, it's true we hear a lot about that, like uh, private security being um, then sometimes, I, I don't know if you were referring to that, but in our research, we found that they are asked tasks which are not what they were supposed to do. Uh, they are asked to do cleaning. Uh, they are asked to, to do demining sometimes, dangerous tasks which have not been uh, uh, included in the contract. And they are very much, um, in fact, yes, in the power of the of the clients. Um, so, Greg uh, or Jael, do you want to react to that? Happily, yeah, Joel. I don't know if you want to jump in first, but uh, but I have some thoughts. Um, Go on, Greg. Thank you. I mean, these are two really important points, I think, and and often not discussed enough. Um, on on one side, if you speak to a lot of guards who have been working, let, let's take a UN agency as an example. We won't take a particular one, but if they've been working as a guard at that UN agency facility for a number of years, they will probably nine times out of 10 say that they work for that agency. I mean, if, if they're a local guard, when they go home and someone says, who do you work for? They'll probably say, I work for that UN agency. They they won't say they work for IDG security or something like that. They're, they ve they feel very much a part of that company, uh, for, uh, part of their, their client organization. Now, that that's good and bad. Like We, we want them to feel like they're, they're at home there. We want them to feel like they're empowered. We want them to feel like they're, uh, they're sort of got a sense of belonging there. But that, that also comes with the risk of... I, I don't want to say abuses in in the very extreme sense, but in a, in a broad sense, uh, they can be asked to do tasks which are above and beyond what their contracts to do. Now, for me as a manager, I can say, well, that's a breach of contract. So I'm 
in the in the worst case scenario, I'm going to take my client to to court, and in in the best case scenario, I'm going to have a conversation with my client to say either you we rewrite the contracts and, and you put this in it or you stop doing those additional tasks and activities. And I've had those conversations with clients. Um, and I think this is where project management comes into it as well. I think on, on the client side, they need to understand the TOR. They need to reread it and review it and make sure that what the tasks are, are there are being sort of conducted are, are within the TOR. And then on the project management side, on the, the security service provider, they need to have regular oversight. You need to have project managers who are regularly visiting the sites, who are going to see what the conditions are like, the working conditions, they're talking with the guards. And if that company is stretched too thin and they're taking on sort of low budget, quite poor quality uh, contracts, then they're not going to give it that level of oversight. And this is this is the sort of thing that you get more of when you pay a bit more for it. You know, you get a better service quality as with any service industry. Um, and I think that's something that's important. But um, ultimately, I think it, it does, it falls on both sides, but but those humanitarian development clients need to consider the fact that these guards are, whilst they may, may not fall under the welfare of um, of, of the agency or the, the humanitarian organisation, they that doesn't mean that you sort of don't have any responsibility over them and i think asking them to do additional services it's demeaning it's not within the um within their tor to do it in their individual tr i mean and it's very hard for them to say no to that because if if you're a client they feel forced to do it i mean they're not going to turn around to you and say no no i can't possibly do that i'm not employed to do it because they want to try and keep the client happy as well they want to be recognized for doing good quality work um and they're ultimately often they're probably quite in a lot of companies worried about losing their job for for not doing it i i'm not just trying to sort of hype it up and say idg is good but i i and my project managers and the teams often say to our guards if you're asked to do something that's not in the tor tell us tell us about it so we can then go and sort of uh, on your behalf um argue against the client make sure that that doesn't happen um, but if you're if it's a guard who's working for a company that doesn't necessarily give them those rights, that's not going to happen. They're going to end up doing tasks which are potentially dangerous um, and and that they're not trained to do or qualified to do, which is putting all sorts of things at harm. And not only that, it puts that overall acceptance at risk within local communities often because um, you create those disparities and abuses between local communities, which is where your guard force often comes from. And and these international or, or local NGOs and, and agencies. And I think that's a problem that needs to be addressed. And then in terms of um, local laws, uh, private securities uh, at the local level, of course, they're, they're subject to local laws, but international private security companies are also um, held to international laws as well. So we're, we're heavily legislated in that sense. Um, I mean, I think I've probably gone on enough, but Joel, if you if you wanted to step in, then please go ahead. Oh yes, yeah, most definitely. I want to say um, a few things. Uh, so, uh, in just responding to uh, th that query on terms of reference, there is the contracting between the private security company and the humanitarian actor, which can be all nice and on paper. And the private security company can be able to say all the things that they're doing that uh, um, fit in with the humanitarian um, elements that are needed and rights and human rights. And uh, um, if you look at an example, and I'm gonna give an example of Kenya, uh, we in paper, and even looking at the national, um, the private security um, company that takes care of uh, the, the, the guarding companies, all this legislation is there and everybody says that they are adhering to the legislation and they all have a calculation. They know it so well that a guard is supposed to work six days a week and that uh, they're supposed to be paid overtime and they know the calculation of overtime plus on the public holidays that they work because you're not going to not have a guard because it's it's a public holiday. So they, they have the calculation so well and they know what the minimum wage is. But when you come to the contract between the private security company and the guard, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, going back on the contract. So um, 
I will pay you just what I want to pay you. It will, it may not be minimum wage or sometimes it will be minimum wage, but I'm not going to pay you overtime. You're still going to work seven days a week. And so what am I saying? I'm saying that those who are contracting, the humanitarian actors need to be conscious. They need to be aware of the type of contract that they're signing. They also need to decide whether they want to be part of uh, um, just uh, looking into how they can uh, audit what's going on. Because you, as a humanitarian actor, you can audit um, the people that you, you have contracted. And so are they fulfilling some of these things that they said that they're going to do? But we found that a lot of them, th there isn't audit. Nobody knows what's going on. You probably want to treat the guard as an outsider. Uh, whilst he, in, in his space, has been in your uh, company for the past five or so years, wants to see himself as, as part of you. So there's that um, challenge that is faced. But the, the point is that we do need to be aware of uh, um, the potential risks when we do not look into auditing some of the um, actors that we are getting into contracts with. Thank you. Thank you. So, so we have another question from John uh, from GISF um, about a uh, question of uh, advice that we could give on making the case to donors. So we, I briefly mentioned the fact that donors somehow uh, may not prioritize sec security. That's one, 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 one important dimension. We see that donors impose lots of requirements on the humanitarian sector, um, and perhaps uh, the hiring of a responsible security provider should be part of the list of requirements that they impose, taking security seriously. We see that some donors do it, but it's far from being systematic. And so arguments could be derived from research, just like the one Jail presented, uh, and uh, the work we've been doing on humanitarian contracting, the list of risks we've been putting forward. All these documents, we will um, then make them available on the chat. Links uh, will be available on the chat uh, at the end of this um, uh, discussion. So yes, our work is really to make the case uh, towards uh, donors, towards the humanitarian sector, um, itself. I would add also that it's not only the problem with the donors, it's also the problem with uh, people doing the fundraising within humanitarian organizations. They may not be connected with the security managers. They may not prioritize security, and they may assume that actually uh, these are, you know, um, additional costs on which they could cut because donors would privilege uh, to fund direct relief or protection activities, and not, if you want, uh, other functions such as security. So I think there are also many assumptions within uh, the humanitarian sector and a disconnect perhaps between uh, fundraising and the management of security within organizations. And as we saw in our research, a total lack of awareness for the international standards. So people just assume that, okay, what's out there is what they will get. They don't know that there are professional uh, security providers out there, and that there are standards to which uh, they can relate to select uh, their private security providers. So that's that's a problem with donors and a problem with the organizations themselves. Um, you, we have a question from Gulam. Um, just just very briefly on that as well. Please. I think difficult conversations need to happen with the donors. And I, I mean, this was one of the frustrations I had with it when I was in the humanitarian development sectors is that all too often that doesn't happen, not just on security, but on all sorts of things. People are quite frightened about the people who give them money. Um, and, and that it, I understand why, but ultimately on things like this, security, you can't half-heartedly do it and you can't do it on the cheap. It doesn't work. And I think that's what the whole conversation is about. Um, and ultimately... It is the responsibility to advocate at a higher level among the donors to say that if you want us to go and deliver aid in this high risk environment, we need to make sure we can safeguard our staff and assets and, and facilities in order to do that. And if they don't want to pay for that, then it makes it very hard to do it. Um, and I think those those conversations need to happen and they're probably not happening enough as it stands at the moment. Mm -hmm. So regarding the, the rule of engagement and use of force policy, 
uh, I think this is also an important element when uh, contracting a private security company. Uh, we've discussed about the, um, the fact that there is a, uh, that the humanitarian sector is rarely engaging armed guards, actually. Uh, most of humanitarian actors are not engaging armed guards. But still, uh, you don't need always a weapon to, to commit abuses or violence. Uh, many incidents are committed without the use of firearms. Um, so how do you see the, um, this question of, of the policy and making sure that uh, use of force is well regulated? Perhaps there are also implications for training. Greg, perhaps? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's huge implications on training. This is a big part about what training is about. Um, there's lots of different types of weapons as well, and they all need a use of force and, and uh, IUFs, as we call them, rules for the use of force. Um, a baton is a weapon. I mean, you could kill someone with a baton, and often that's not thought about. So even if you think you're not employing armed guards, I mean, they might not be bearing firearms, but if they have batons, they still have weapons. So you're technically under international legality. I mean, you're you're still employing guards who might be armed. Um, we have two different uses of force. We have, um, and we have an RUF policy, we call it as well. And those two different RUFs, one is for our, for our armed guards um, who are bearing arms. Um, as I say, which we do have, we do have people who are having weapons for, um, on our UN contracts, a lot of our UN contracts. Um, and then we've got the RUF, we call it for our unarmed guards. And they're broadly the same, but the, the levels of escalation go up higher, as you would expect, to the lethal use of force if they're bearing arms. Uh, companies that um, don't have those sorts of things in place are, are just in breach of all sorts of different accreditations and, and standards. Um, and frankly, if they don't have that in place in the first place, you're employing a company that is not um, operating a, a, with any form of quality or professionalism. Mm -hmm. These sorts of things are essential. And again, if, if you're employing companies that that don't have these then i mean i think you need to really address your procurement processes again and do diligence because that's probably one of the first things you would want to look at um that a company would have is making sure that they have a an up-to-date recently reviewed contextually relevant um rule of the use of force and that should be it doesn't have to be but it, sh it largely it should be delineated between armed and unarmed guards as well because you've got dis different escalations there um, I don't know if that answers the question, but. Oh, you're muted. Uh... Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for this. Um, I think we are coming to the, the final part or last part of this discussion, the last 15 minutes where we are going to discuss solutions. And and um, but then it's it's, uh, I think, uh, important to say um, that there are there are instruments and that's indeed even though humanitarian organizations may not be aware of what has been happening in the private security industry and i think greg you're describing it well i mean this professionalization of the sector um and we've been working at icoca uh, on developing arguments on doing research um and also on developing training um so there is a training available uh, online and i think you, you'll find it in the chat on how to select uh, private security providers, the questions you need to ask them yourself before uh, contracting private security. Do you really need a private security provider? What are the right questions to ask yourself? And then going through all the uh, processes in terms of you know, um, uh, procurement, uh, the due diligence um, throughout uh, the rela contractual relation, the contracting, what you need to have in the contract. And then uh, later on, the relation with the private security uh, company, um, the making sure that guards are properly trained and that you have this constant dialogue with your private security provider and that you also train them so that they become aware of the mandate, the role of your organization, and that they can become also uh, part somehow of the project you may have in that given country of being accepted of delivering uh, humanitarian aid. So this training is, um, is there specifically for the humanitarian sector to use for private, for, for security managers within organizations. And it goes through all the process from the selection to 
the management of the, the relation with the private security uh, contractor. Uh, there is also, of course, um, so that, that would answer the question from, from Francesca about the criteria to select professional private security providers. Um, and about the question of an accredited roster for humanitarians, uh, we suggest that when you are going to select uh, a private security provider, uh, you contact ICOCA because we uh, actually can give advice um, on uh, the security industry in the country in which you operate. Uh, we have a list of members uh, which went through this uh, certification process. It means that we are we have been checking those uh, companies and we are not only checking them once, but we are actually doing constant monitoring because the companies which are ICOCA members have to uh, also um, give us an account regularly on their, on their work. And we do also monitoring missions in the field to ensure that we have uh, a constant dialogue with our members. Um, you see in the chat that there is this uh, research also from GISF, the module 14 um, of the Security to Go Risk Management Toolkit. So it gives a kind of uh, excellent checklist of the various steps uh, you need to take as uh, a humanitarian organization when you contract private security providers. Uh, Greg, Jael, you want to add to this? Jael, you go first if you'd like. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to add about uh, contracting, uh, somebody asked, um, let me just get back there. Um, somebody talked about um, criteria for selecting professional private security providers. Many um, of, the, of the countries have got a list of those that are licensed in order to undertake private security. And there are those national um, uh, contracting laws that have been set up by different countries that you can be able to um, look at as a criteria in order for you to get the right private security company. So that's just what I wanted to add. Thank you. Yeah, I um, yeah, I agree with that. And I, I can't tell you what you should do to, to employ a good private security provider because it's very contextually relevant um, and it depends on your organization, your mandate, the way you're operating, your budget, all sorts of different things. But I can tell you what you shouldn't do, and largely that is you shouldn't contract a company that hasn't got international accreditations. And the accreditations, the ISOs that relate to that are ISO 27001, ISO 18788, and PSC 1, which was from 2015, but we just got re-accredited for PSC 2, which is 2022. Um, these are essential, I think, and largely it is going to be the bigger more international organizations that have them, but they're given them for a reason. It's because you go through such a ridiculously stringent process where they do a visual physical audit to your site. Um, they remotely go to a bunch of them and they physically go to a bunch of them and they actually check in person that you are doing everything that you say you're doing and they want evidence for everything. So you have to prove it. You can't just say it. They have interviews and such, but you have to prove it. You have to pre present physical evidence to say that you're doing what you say you're doing and what's included in those is all sorts of things from human rights cultural awareness training um rules of use of force how you store your weapons and ammunition if you have them um what the facility is like are the guards paid on time are the guards paid in full what's the leave process is like i mean everything you can possibly imagine that goes into this they do it in detail and they over i mean we just went through an 8.5 day audit to to do that um, and we do that every 12 months. Um, and if there's anything that sort of crops up where we haven't, I mean, we haven't had any of these issues, fortunately, as a company. But if, if we were not meeting any of those standards, they would recheck us and we would have to provide additional evidence to show how we are going to fix those problems. Um, and if, if you're employing a company that doesn't do any of that and they don't have those accreditations, I would really think twice about working with them. Um, and a lot of local national security companies have those accreditations um so you should uh, i say it, it doesn't mean you have to, to go and for for a massive international company you can work with a local company but they should be accredited to those standards and if i was in your shoes of wanting to select 
um, a security sector provider, I would approach exactly as Vincent just said. I would go to ICOCA and ask for their support in that. It's their day job. They know. They they go through this process themselves. There's a, a full accreditation process that comes with being an ICOCA industry member. We have to provide evidence. We have to go through this very comprehensive checklist of things that we do and don't do. Um, and ICOCA has the answers to a lot of those things. Um, ICOCA is not the only one doing this sort of thing, but I would say they're probably the best one doing it. And and if, if a company has ICOCA membership... 99 times out of 100, those companies are probably working to the standards that you would want to work with as a security partner. Um, there was some conversation last time I spoke with ICOCA about them putting together a blacklist of companies. Uh, there's there's pros and against on that. Um, I'm sure you can have some bilateral conversations about that, but there's, there's lots of bad companies out there. There's lots of abuses. There's lots of poor working conditions. And you... Uh, Go, just going through a tender process with th three local companies to try and find who's working and who's not working well isn't going to answer your questions. You need to go in more depth when it comes to this, um, just because, the, you know, the risks are quite high. Yes, um, this this point of distinguishing, um, let's say, uh, private security actors from military actors, uh, I think this is also something we we uh, we're doing at the moment. It's true that there has been lots of discussions on Wagner recently and their impacts on on the civilian population, on the protection, on the work of humanitarian actors. Uh, but what is important to to distinguish here is that uh, most of the private security companies. Uh, are actually trying hard to comply with the law. Many companies are doing that. Uh, this is a sector which is getting more and more professional and very different, of course, from mercenaries and other actors. Uh, so we should not mix the two. So in the chat, you will find more uh, resources. Um, uh, the, the training is there. It's designed specifically for security managers within companies and it really addresses most of the the points or all of, of the points we've discussed today uh, so really i invite you to uh, to have a look um any other question or final remark Perhaps, uh, yes please was that for for us or for the participants or everybody. Okay. Sorry. I also know that we have lots of experienced people in the in the okay. virtual room today, and I, I recognize some names, people who have been working on these on these issues. We've recently published a, a blog post by Jan Maria Dalasta uh, on this topic, and we have created a section to encourage discussion and debates on the relation between the humanitarian sector and private security. So you find more information on our on our blog. Uh, we are interested in, in research in this topic, in, in more contributions. Also, we've created a list of incidents you can find visiting the ICOCA website, where we try to document uh, incidents involving private security. Uh, I think we need also more, more transparency on this. Very often, these, these incidents are, are not uh, documented. We, we don't know what's happening, so we, we need that in order also to highlight the uh, the, the the responsible security actors distinguish from um, responsible actors which which do not uh, respect international standards. So um, please uh, visit these uh, these different websites. Uh, we are available for for more information. On my part, I will I will give you the floor, Gregory and and Jael, for a, a concluding remark. On my side, I think. What I, I, I find is that the humanitarian sector has an impact as a client. And that's what I think we need to realize because in some countries, private security has become so big uh, because there is no other job opportunity for people. There is no other industry. And so because of um, a crisis sometimes, because of a conflict, the private security industry has become very big and has become a major source of income for the local population. And actually, humanitarian actors have an influence. I want to give you an anecdote. Um, uh, 
uh, recently there was a, one of our member companies which stopped informing us about their compliance. And so we suspended their membership because we, we could not get information from them. And we informed their clients, we informed humanitarian organizations in the field that we could not you know, guarantee uh, that they were not members, that uh, their security providers were not members. This humanitarian organization contacted the, the security provider and two hours later, they called us in order to, to know how to comply because it's important for them because, because they need this contract, okay? So actually it shows that humanitarian organizations have a big power through their contracting, through their due diligence in improving the, humanitarian, the, the private security industry in the country because many companies will, will want to apply to become, uh, uh, to get the contract and through their contracting practices, uh, humanitarian organizations have a huge influence and they can contribute to improve the standards within a country. So it's it's not something um, unimportant. You really have a role to play in improving the, the quality and the compliance with international standards of the security industry in a given country through uh, your contracting practices and through due diligence. So um, Greg, Jael, one last word. Yeah, sure. Okay. Just, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, great. Uh, just, just a, some very minor takeaways, I would say, from my side. One is that um, ICOCA has a whistleblowing function. So if you see practices which are not good, that includes working conditions and all sorts of different uh, types of abuses or, or issues, then use the whistleblowing function. I think it's really valuable. I think we need to highlight poor practice when we see it. Um, additionally, I mean, just to reiterate what, what Vincent is saying, I think you guys as humanitarian development workers have far more impact on this industry than you possibly could ever imagine. You're our clients. You can dictate what the practices look like. If there's one key takeaway, I would probably say, and, uh, and really hope that you take away from this, is that you set the conditions. What I would say to you is set the uh the minimum salary or the minimum pay and the minimum hours and the minimum benefits that you want the guards to have um when you're putting out a procurement uh, if you do that you'll you'll cut away the competition very very quickly if you say a guard has to be paid minimum of x amount they have to have x benefits which could include insurance health benefits um working time uh, sort of working hours and things like that if you set those parameters uh, overnight the whole sector will improve um but until you do that you're going to find extreme competition in an already extremely competitive industry and the practices that joel's been pointing out will only continue to get worse um and just in kenya alone i think this actually i think i think this is actually your um statistics so i apologize but uh, in just kenya alone more than a million people are in, employed in this sector so we've yes. got to come up with ways where we can improve um, and i say that that for me would be the the best quickest way to do it is just set those parameters when you're putting out a tender and if your procurement and logistics and, and teams are not doing that they're feeding into a very negative trend um, and I think it's really important that we start to make those uh, make those practices uh, a baseline, a given. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Greg. Um, so as humanitarian actors, I'm sure you are cognizant of the fact that um, uh, risks have increased in your area of operations and they're not going to stop. The risks will only increase. And so the voice of the guard should be listened to. And the only way you can listen to the voice of the guard is to raise your awareness levels. Greg Gregory has touched a lot on, on how to raise your awareness levels when um, tendering out, when doing procurement. And um, the last thing I must say is cost should not be the only driver that is risky. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone, for your participation. Um, thank you for all your questions. Uh, of course, we, we remain available for, for advice. Uh, and um, yes, I wish you a, a good continuation of this uh, uh, week of discussions. Uh, and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thanks.
Thank you. Everybody. Thank you.